great. But he is um, joining us from Virginia. And Zach uh, is co-author with his wife, Kelly Weiner-Smith, of the delightful book, Soonish. Uh, if you, I don't know, some of the conversation we've been having beforehand, as people have joined, he is working on some other books, including Space Settlement. Um, so that was part of what we've been talking about uh, leading into this, but he will really be uh, talking to us about Emily's book, which is uh, about the work of astronomers and doing what they do. And of course, we're at a great time of year for seeing the night sky now that any of us who get out at night and I'd like to do nightly walks, um, there's a lamentable part that the, it's darkness is coming earlier, the daylight's day is getting shorter, but here that means it's clear enough to see the sky. And um, this book really helps invite us to do that more um, engagingly and smartly and, and with more curiosity. So um, I'll turn this over to Zach now and um, take it away, both of you, Emily and Zach, thank you. Thanks for that introduction. Um, let's talk about this book that you wrote. Yeah. Uh, so I've been trying to think about how I would describe this book. I, I assume everyone here has bought it, and if they haven't, they ought to do it now. Uh, but the way I think of it is it's kind of like, it's mostly a memoir, but it's also got a lot of history and kind of a guide to astronomy. And, and what I really like is how the, the history kind of situates you. So you, you go through like a broad history of this field that sort of leads us to what your experience has been. And, and especially you talk about how that experience is maybe not what most people think the life of a scientist is like. So can you maybe talk about what, what misconceptions you've encountered that people have about being an astronomer? Oh yeah, for sure. And this was a big part of why I wrote the book because whenever I tell somebody I'm an astronomer, there's this little sense of excitement of how cool I have a question about the universe. I've always wondered this thing about black holes, but People are also curious about how I actually do my job. They'll say things like, how are you awake right now? Shouldn't you just be like permanently nocturnal? Um, I got asked if I got to go visit the Hubble Space Telescope <laughs> high above Earth, which sadly no. And there's just a lot that I realized people were curious about, about what it's like to actually be a scientist. So they'll picture an astronomer and you have like this person in a lab coat for some reason, like huddled in a dark dome all night, every night, kind of never emerging into the light and just waiting for something to happen in the sky. And something that surprises a lot of people is that there's this kind of Indiana Jonesy aspect to being an astronomer and what we do. So astronomers have dealt with um, like wild bears loose in the observatory with volcanoes erupting near the telescopes, um, gunfire, swarms of ladybugs, which is a lot scarier than it sounds. Um, we'll travel to these really remote corners of the planet. We'll fly into the stratosphere on experimental planes that have telescopes in the back. And we're all doing this to find these like little bits of light from really far away stars or galaxies because those bits of light that we're searching for are helping us answer some of the oldest questions that humans have really ever asked. So these are like, how did we get here? What else is out there? Are we alone? And the questions are these grand, beautiful things, but answering those questions can sometimes mean doing kind of absurd stuff like, all right, I'm driving up a mountain in a snowstorm. Um, I can't, you know, actually open the dome because it's too windy or I'm getting experimental aircraft safety training. And that sense of the absurd seems like a fun thing to share with people along with the window into the science of what we do and just what the life of a scientist is like. Yeah, I feel like, it, it might be a, you know, I, I worry sometimes kids could get discouraged because they don't realize it's also fun. Um, there's, there's a lot of camaraderie uh, and, and, and sort of shared lore that develops in every field that's particular to that field. Um, yeah. we, we, so you mentioned going up in a plane. So one of, one of the like weirder parts uh, that you describe is going up in this specially made plane called Sophia. So can you describe what that's like and why? Yeah, so SOFIA is the is an acronym. Everything in astronomy is an acronym. And it stands for the Stratospheric Observatory for Infrared Astronomy. And the whole reasoning behind SOFIA is that we have telescopes that are incredibly good at detecting the same light we see with our eyes here on Earth. But we want to study light all over the electromagnetic spectrum. So things like X-rays or things like 
radio wavelengths that are way longer than what our eyes can see. And one thing we like to study is infrared light, which is best studied if you can get above a lot of water vapor. Water vapor in our um, atmosphere kind of wreaks havoc on studying this sort of light. So ideally you'd put something in space, but that's very challenging and very expensive. So there was this middle ground of, well, we'll take a telescope, we'll put it in the back of a specially modified 747 that's been designed to fly with its door open and fly it up to about 43,000 feet. So higher than most um, commercial airliners fly. So we'll fly it up there and then open the door so that we can point the telescope through like from inside the plane and actually take data from a place where the clouds are out of the way. So I first heard about this type of observing when I was an undergraduate. I had a professor named Jim Elliott that um, had talked about observing on an airborne observatory and using a telescope on a plane to like discover the atmosphere of Pluto. And I loved the idea, but at the time I was a young undergrad. I had pretty much, I had almost no experience with planes. Everything I knew about planes I knew from the movie like Air Force One. And everything <laughs> I knew about telescopes I knew from my little backyard telescope that like would set up on a table. So in my mind, I had these astronomers like standing in the open back door of a plane with like the wind and balancing a tripod telescope and like, I don't know, holding on really tight. And it wasn't until I was learning a little bit more about how observing works that I found out how Sophia actually works. They have a sealed chamber in the back of the plane where you can mount a telescope on the world's largest ball bearing to keep it nice and floating and steady through turbulence. And when you're flying on it and they open that chamber, it's so well designed that you can't even tell that the door is opening. You're suddenly flying with a pl in a plane with a hole in the side and you just can't tell. But the actual act of flying was wild. We flew for like 12 hours and just chased the darkness because you can fly through time zones. You can basically stay in a good night sky for as long as possible. On my trip, we actually were flying in the Southern Hemisphere. We flew close to Antarctica. I saw the Aurora for the first time in my life from the cockpit of this plane. <laughs> it was just it was <laughs> the most unreal observing experience I've ever gone through. And I think if you told like mini me who just thought space was cool, that I was going to be doing research and observing stars from a plane flying through the Antarctic stratosphere, I would not have believed you. Yeah, and, then that, and that, that leads me to a question I wanted to ask, which is, um, so that's one of the really adventurous parts of the book. One thing, one of the trajectories of your book is about how there was kind of this romantic age of astronomy when nothing was digital. It was really just somebody in a dark room with a plate uh, um, taking photographs. And, 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 and now it's starting to change. Uh, and, and from a scientific perspective, for the better, because the, the digital stuff gets way more data and you can do a lot of stuff automatically, so maybe you don't even have to go there. Um, but do you, do you feel like something has been lost or will be lost uh, as that, that world goes away? Um, I, I think there's some things that we can potentially lose. Um, you're right that the science is unarguably better. Um, I talked to lots of people that used to use telescopes back in an era when we captured images on these glass photographic plates and they were really fiddly, really hard to work with, really fragile. You could do really good science with them, but it just wasn't, um, it wasn't at the same level of the sort of digital work that we do today. Um, we're also getting better at uh, um, automating telescopes or doing something where you can either have it run almost robotically or where you can operate a telescope from afar or where you can input a sort of plan saying I want to point at these three objects in this order with exactly the setup and then just kind of let somebody hit play and let it happen. So it becomes very efficient and there's some research that's just ideal for this but you also lose some creativity if this ever becomes the only way that we observe. So science really depends kind of on serendipity at a certain point. You need to be able to take five minutes at the end of a night and say, hey, Betelgeuse was doing something weird. Let's just take a look at it with this little bit of spare time and see what's happening. Or you might go to a telescope, start observing, and then realize that you want to tweak something about how you've planned your night or set up the camera a little differently. And that kind of nimbleness is really great for top-notch science 
and you lose it if everything's automated. So there's the real issue is that there's no one size fits all type of science really anywhere. And especially when you're talking about like the universe. So the automation and remote work is great, but we want to keep using as many tools as we can to kind of get the full and complete look at the sky that we need. Do you think it's, it's funny you say, that. I, I, I happen to have a friend who's an old astronomer who remembers the old like plate days of things. And the, do, you, do you worry that if things get more digital and automated, there'll be less just sort of working knowledge in the heads of astronomers, uh, uh, you know, like, like the ability to notice weirdness? This is something that a lot of people actually brought up when I interviewed them. They worry about losing, in a way, the ability to recognize the one weird thing. Um, big data is an amazingly powerful tool in astronomy right now. Like the fact that we can work with millions of stars in a data set is awesome. But are you really going to be able to find the one star in that data set that's super weird and needs to be like poked and prodded on yeah. its own? They also worry about people losing the knowledge of how telescopes work because somebody is going to have to build the next generation of telescopes and automate them and come at it with the mind of an observer saying, what can we teach the telescope to do? And what institutional memory do we have? And unless we get telescopes to teach other telescopes, we're going to need people with these sort of old school backgrounds to keep this sort of observing working. That's interesting. Yeah, I've, I've talked to engineers who have a similar sort of like, everyone's in software, nobody knows hardware. And it's just like these old people now who know how to operate these machines and, mm -hmm. uh, and it might go away. Yeah, I, do, do, do you have any ideas about a solution? Like, should there be a training program or something? So there are training programs. I have colleagues who specialize in building telescope instruments and who are training students to work on that. And I think the hope is that as long as we can keep doing all different types of observing and really use kind of the full tool set that we have available, that we'll keep training people to continue that on. Yeah. And what, 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 what is um, something you're excited about with this change? Um, with the shift to more automation, you mean? Yeah, like big data, digital, automated. So I very literally study stars. My research is focused on how stars work and we will try to do a great deal sometimes with a handful of stars. We'll get a data set of 17 exploding stars or 30 or 40 stars of a certain weird type just because they're difficult to observe and we need to very carefully observe each one at a time. So if we can get to the point where our data samples multiply by a factor of even 10 that's already amazing and we're multiplying by a lot more than that so just the the scientific rigor is better which i know sounds boring but it means that we can <laughs> have a lot more fun with the data and actually dig into the physics yeah. of what it's doing cool uh yeah it, it, it pops into my head it reminds me of when genetics became genomics it's like all of a sudden instead of looking at one gene you can look at eight million uh, right. but then that, of course <laughs> that makes the questions a million times harder too though because um, there's this fire hose of data coming in. Um, another theme of your book is um, the experience of women in astronomy, uh, and, and specifically as like women being at astronomy facilities uh, and how they're not always accommodating. Could you talk about, you know, uh, your impression of what it was like in the 50s and 60s for people like uh, Vera Rubin and, and what they yeah. experienced? So Vera Rubin is one of the people that I specifically write about in the book. And this is exploring um, the sort of the period of time where people very much still had to go to the telescope and observe at the telescope all night and sleep on the mountain during the day. And the person who was in charge of observations was known as the principal investigator or the lead observer. And for years, women were not principal investigators or lead observers, and women were not really even invited to work and live on the mountain. And the reasoning was usually hand waved as something like, oh, then people will bring their wives and it will be a distraction. Or we can't possibly find a good place for the women to stay. And people pretty quickly started solving this and women started going anyway, but it served as this extra barrier that they had to deal with. So Vera Rubin was the first woman to observe under her own name on the biggest telescope in California. At the time, it might've been the biggest telescope in the world. It was a 200 inch mirror, which doesn't sound that big, but that's enormous. Um, so she broke down this barrier when she became the first female principal investigator at that telescope. And what I always find funny is that's not even what Vera Rubin's famous for because she's famous for discovering dark matter. She was a just utterly brilliant scientist and a really talented observer. Um, somebody told me a story about her where she was observing at a telescope 
and the um, motor running the telescope broke. So the telescope could observe perfectly, but it was stuck pointing straight up. And I think most, there's plenty of astronomers sort of just gone like, oh, okay, the night's done. Yep, guess that's it, because your telescope's broken. And she just on the fly in real time calculated what was going to be passing overhead and right through the telescope's field of view, like she couldn't move it at all and would just wait for stuff to pass over, get data, let it keep going and did like a whole night of observing just like that. And this is what we should know her for this and her amazing discovery of dark matter and all the research she did. And something that bugs me is that women don't get written about as the wild geniuses that men tend to do in science. Um, and it's something I was aware of when I was writing the book. Um, it's partly unfair because the lone genius model of science isn't really true. We have science done by enormous teams of people working really hard, but that sort of super genius man is what we picture when we talk about successful scientists. And it's a depiction women don't get and it affects how women are celebrated. Um, so Vera Rubin was never once recognized with the Nobel Prize and her research really, like it started a new subdiscipline in astrophysics studying dark matter. So the, there's still things we don't know about dark matter, but plenty of men have won the prize for similarly kind of open topics and trying to recognize the brilliant work that she did and what she accomplished in a time when there were really like very active tangible barriers for women participating in astronomy was something I was really happy to include in the book. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, you, meant, you mentioned that because you also discussed like your personal experiences with, with what sexism is still in the business. And so it's, 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 it's clearly not what it used to be like where they would just literally say no. Um, but there's still stuff and we all know about it. Uh, uh, and I, I think I don't know a single woman scientist who hasn't had some experience of sexism or, or, or whatever. And do you feel like, has it gotten harder to push uh, uh, push forward because there aren't these like tangible, this is obviously BS type of barriers. Yeah, it's, it's funny because I think about my own experiences in the field and I like to think, oh, I've been very lucky with my colleagues and the people that have supported me and sexism hasn't been a major factor. But then there's always little things. There's a paper that didn't get into a certain journal or losing out on a job or like just one weird interaction at a telescope. Mm -hmm. And they could most certainly be chalked up to sexism, but they could also be blamed on like bad luck stuff. or just somebody being a jerk. And it makes it a little strange to, it's very easy to talk yourself out of it being an ism and it just mm -hmm. being a one-off thing. And it is, you don't, of course, ever want things to be worse. We still have a lot to improve and we want things to get better, but we need room to start thinking of it as something that's less blatant and, you know, you can heroically swoop in and be the person that saves the day and more something that's just insidious and needs to be dismantled a little bit. Yeah, that, something I remember thinking about ages ago when I was a physics student, there, there weren't a lot of women in the department, but the ones who were there were all just tough as nails. And I remember having the thought like, we've probably, what's happened, the pernicious thing is you're not seeing the ones who aren't that tough because they, they, they had trouble. Yes. Uh, whereas there are men who are like awkward as can be, but they get support. Right. Um, and we shouldn't have to be so, tough. Yeah. As, astronomy's right. tough already. Right. <laughs> and <laughs> this was something that has been very clear to me. I mean, I, in my interviews, there were women that had run into really difficult challenges in their careers. And there's many that I didn't get to talk to because they were pushed out by the, career, right. the field being unwelcoming or even just dealing with individuals that had the power to really ruin things. So it's a shame that that's still happening and it, it really should be the exception that that happens and it's all too familiar to too many people. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, moving to another controversial topic is, is Mauna Kea, which is a big part of your book. Mm -hmm. uh, could, you, could you talk about what, what went down and what the controversy is about? Yeah, so um, I'll do a little bit of background for folks who might not be fully familiar with this, but Mauna Kea is the tallest mountain in Hawaii. It's this just absolutely beautiful place, and it's one of the best spots on the planet for astronomy. So telescopes have been operating there since 1970, and around the 1980s, there were efforts to have the observatory like draw up a development 
and environmental impact plan to kind of evaluate what the long-term plans were for astronomy on Mauna Kea. And part of that plan was they were allowed um, up to 13 telescopes on the mountain. And they reached that 13 telescope limit. And I mean, Hawaii has been an absolute leader in astronomical discovery. It's been an amazing place to do this research. I was a graduate student at the University of Hawaii and it was really marked as a wonderful place for this type of work. So then in 2009, Mauna Kea was chosen as the future site for the 30 meter telescope. Um, astronomers are terrible at naming things. So I know it's a boring <laughs> sounding name, but it's exactly what it sounds like. Uh, we tend to shorten it to TMT, but it's a 30 meter mirrored telescope. It will be the largest telescope in the Northern Hemisphere when it's built. Um, operating from Mauna Kea, it would get pictures 12 times sharper than the Hubble Space Telescope, but from the ground. And we'll be able to learn about you know, some of the earliest moments of our universe, um, the birthplaces of new black holes. You can look at planets that could potentially host life. Like the telescope is unarguably amazing. The problem that came about um, grew at first out of this idea that the TMT was going to violate that 13 telescope agreement because there were already 13 telescopes on the mountain. This was a violation of what people had seen as a plan and a finite plan for development on the mountain. So that initial objection came up and it kicked off years of legal battles. Um, there have been protests. Um, the road to the summit has actually been blocked several times to protest and halt construction on the telescope itself that grew out of this initial debate that has evolved a bit since then. Um, so there's been some real misunderstandings about this debate. Um, there's some opposition to the telescope that just come from mistaken beliefs about what the telescope would do to the mountain. Um, there was this idea of, God, it'll drill deep into the mountain and poison the water table, which is not what it's going to do. Um, there were worries that the telescope would be nuclear powered or that it would tear up cultural and ancestral sites. Um, and in reality, there's been a lot of very careful environmental impact work. Um, people have worked with archeologists to choose a site that kept the telescope far away from any cultural sites, um, away from the summit. And then on the other hand, the debate sometimes gets simplified and in the media, it can be turned into just a religion versus science thing. Um, so the truth is actually far more complex. And I don't think the religion versus science simplification is fair to either side, particularly the objectors. The objections are not coming from an anti-science religious position at all. The opponents aren't protesting astronomy. They're not protesting science. They're not protesting telescopes or the astronomers and scientists. Uh, the TMT at this point has really become a symbol of Hawaii's history with colonialism, land rights, cultural beliefs. Um, some people see it as a focal point for the Hawaiian sovereignty movement. So the debate's not really about the telescope, it's about the land it's on and what building it would symbolize to its opponents. That was a long answer, but it's a, yeah, no, it's no, a, it's, it's a very it's, complicated topic. Yeah. yeah, and I, so my, you know, I know a lot of academics, and my my view is they they at least always intend to do well and and be good about these issues. Uh, I don't think there's a lot mm -hmm. of malice out there. I'm sure it exists, but it's it's not too common. Mm -hmm. And then the question becomes like, what what is the appropriate thing to do? So I, I believe you mentioned like there was a lot of outreach attempts to like engage with the community, but but maybe it didn't get off on the right foot, um, at least with some people. Yeah, so um, it's, it's become a really deeply controversial and kind of polarizing topic in astronomy. Um, this was the only topic that people would regularly not want to talk to me about wow. um, when I was interviewing people for the book. Um, I thought it was important to include because it's still very much a part of the human experience of astronomy. Um, but there have, fortunately, um, people have in recent years been sitting down and talking um, between the telescope consortium and the native Hawaiian community on the big island to try and discuss ways forward and try to consider ways in which um, the TMT can be 
built while also recognizing the very serious and real objections that people have. So like, for example, the Mauna Kea Observatory agreed to remove five of the 13 current telescopes on the mountain. Uh, they developed a zero waste management policy. They tried to choose a site that kept it um, far away from, like I said, archaeological sites that you can't see from most of the island. Um, and they've dedicated financial support to local employment and STEM education. So all of those efforts wound up increasing support for the telescope and it helped bring the scientific goals into better alignment with the community. So there's, there's still been objections. Um, the road was blocked again last summer after all of these agreements had been put in place. So I think it's safe to say there's still more conversation that needs to be happening, but I think getting the groups to talk and finding a way that we can, you know, have a useful dialogue and move forward is the only really good way to go about it. Yeah. Well, that leads to the, the really controversial part uh, that I wanted to get to, and we actually have a question about it already, but we're, we're going to get to it now, which is, uh, I asked uh, before we started this if you wanted to talk about Starlink. Um, so I, I guess probably, probably the way to go is, is if you could explain to the audience what Starlink is uh, and yes. why astronomers are concerned about it. Yes. So Starlink is one of several proposed um, satellite, what are called mega constellations. Um, Starlink is a SpaceX project. Um, there's another one you might have seen in the news just in the past couple days, um, Kuiper, which is um, coming out of Amazon. Uh, there's another one called OneWeb that I think was like a UK effort. But the idea of all of these is that there are these massive constellations of tens of thousands of satellites and they're, they're hoped to one day give the whole planet satellite-based internet. And the model is basically that you just blanket the planet with tens of thousands of these satellites and then boom, you offer global connectivity. So that, that's what they're intended to be. But I think, I think the follow-up question is about what they're, some of their unintended consequences. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, 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 uh, you know, it's funny. I, I, I remember when this first came out. My, I, I'll admit, I'm not an astronomer. I, my instant reaction was like, "Oh, that's neat." Uh, but then all <laughs> the astronomy people I follow were were just like, you know, different levels of feelings about it. You know, some were outraged, some were, you know, mystified. Uh, I mean, I'm sure this fits into the general the space community has a complicated relationship with SpaceX. Uh, period. But um, mm. I don't know. What was your reaction? I mean, I shared a lot of my colleagues' reaction. It was some variant of no, but it was <laughs> less about the idea. I mean, like, obviously the idea of global internet sounds amazing. And it was a little more about the execution of how it happened because kind of shockingly launching huge heaps of satellites like this is something that can just be like approved by the FCC without necessarily asking the many, many other participants that do some sort of work with space. So I think in May of 2019 was the first launch from SpaceX. They sent this batch of, I think, like 60 prototype satellites. They're now up to 540 satellites. Um, they ultimately want, I think, 42,000 of them at different heights above the Earth, um, serving different functions to try and build up this network. And the issue is that they're huge sources of light pollution in the sky. So most of these satellites are really reflective. Um, right now, if a telescope is observing and some of the satellites pass through, they just leave these bright streaks across the image that damage the data. Um, I'm sure a lot of our participants got the chance to go out and get a look at Comet Neowise. And there was an astronomer who posted what was gonna be this just gorgeous photo of the comet. <laughs> And there were these bright, it looks like a cat clawed the image. There's just these bright streaks <laughs> through it. And that's what happens when a satellite passes through any long telescope image. Um, people look at it and they kind of go, well, can't you just like Photoshop them out? And if all we were trying to do is make a pretty picture, then sure. But that's not how the science behind it works. Like if I'm trying to photograph a faint background star and a Starlink satellite just cuts through it, I can't just guess how that star looks. If we're looking for like the flash of a new supernova or a, an asteroid that might quickly slide through the frame and then disappear and Starlink interferes, it starts to pose a huge challenge. Um, this is all only the optical, like you can see these satellites with your eyes if you go out and look for them, but they emit radio wavelengths too. So they're a huge problem for radio astronomers as well. And I think a lot of our shock is they just sort of got tossed up there. 
the a private company was able to make the proposal, give the idea, get approved, and then just start launching. And we were all just sort of left going, wait, we might need to talk about this before, yeah. before we put tens of thousands of them up there. Yeah, my, my impression was part of the issue, so I looked up when this first started how many satellites had ever been launched ever. And I think it was something like 9,000. Uh, yeah. And it's something, something like 2,000 are currently operating. So, so for, for those listening, SpaceX alone is going to put up what you said was 42,000 as their ultimate goal. Yeah, um, and I mean, Kuiper and OneWeb. I, OneWeb, I think, has since been put on ice, but um, Kuiper <laughs> was similar in size. And I mean, this would just so permanently change the way the sky looks, the way Earth orbit right. functions. Like, it's a, it's a order of magnitude increase. In the number of satellites. Yeah, the, the way I heard it described is, is it, yeah, if you have like a hundred thousand LEO uh, low Earth orbit satellites, it's like the sky will twinkle at, at twilight uh, because yeah. Right, yeah. Um, so I, I know uh, which I don't know. Maybe some people want it. Sounds really creepy uh, to me, but um, uh, I, I know there've been some efforts by SpaceX to, or supposedly I'm not on the inside of this to, to engage and try to do some mitigation experiments. Is that is that possible? Uh, yeah, we have talked, I know there's been dialogue with SpaceX about mitigation. I, I have no direct involvement in this, but I've talked to colleagues who have worked on it. Um, out of their 500 and something satellites, they launched one with a special dark coating to see if that would help. And they launched another with a sunshade to try and block the sunlight reflections. Uh, we're still finding out how well this will work. And we're still finding out if other mitigation strategies might work better, if we should try a combination if it is possible and how it affects the function of the satellites. Um, I think what alarms a lot of us, and there's people trying to engage in this conversation with SpaceX, I'm sure the same will be true of Amazon, but I think the worry is they don't really have to listen to us. If this is a private venture and run by a, um, com a profitable company, there's not an immediate argument for why we need to bring them to the table and yeah. make them listen to the scientists. Um, I think it largely poses some really big questions about how we regulate space and the impact of things like this on the night sky. Um, I know there's also questions about like the telecommunications effectiveness of this model, that this might not be the best or only way to accomplish something like global internet. But for our immediate purposes, we want to know what the impact is going to be on the sky. Um, people have actually asked me about my book's title because the title is The Last Stargazers and someone oh. said, is that because of Starlink? And it is not about the light pollution effects of mega constellations or even light pollution here on Earth on the night sky, but it is a look at how astronomy is changing and what stargazing means. And these are another really interesting element that are going to affect how we how we interact with the night sky yeah th th there's been a claim floated and it just it, it 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 seems bonkers to me but i'd love to hear your take which is like well we'll get so much better at space launch we'll put a bunch of uh, james webb telescopes up for you and, and you'll all be happy so the james <laughs> webb space telescope is super cool i love it it's gonna be amazing um but it's been an extraordinary technical accomplishment. Um, so James Webb is uh, the successor to Hubble. Um, Hubble has a mirror that's about two and a half meters from it um, across. And James Webb's mirror is six and a half meters across. Like it's bigger than many of the telescopes we have on the ground right now. Um, and the technical challenge of designing a telescope like that, launching it, getting it to work perfectly is stunning. So I think this solution of, oh, we'll just chuck all the telescopes into space <laughs> doesn't really hold water. And we talked yeah. before about remote or sort of robotic operations only managing some of the science that we want to do. We're still going to want at some point to go to a telescope and work with it ourselves. And unless we're also flying all of the astronomers <laughs> to the, which I know some people would be up for, but not yes. everybody. Um, <laughs> Without that, there's no way that we can functionally do the astronomy that we want to do without having some ground access. And the impact of ground access is something we really need to keep in mind. So assuming the, this just proceeds, uh, which seems like a not unlikely scenario, like how, how bad is the damage to, to the field? Um, from Starlink? 
Yeah, well, in general, very in general. mega constellations. Yeah. It can range. So this is, we're still learning exactly what the Starlink satellites are going to entail. It depends on things like how high they are in the sky, how reflective they are, but it could wreak havoc on things like big sky surveys that look for anything that's changing. Because every time a satellite passes through, it's a change. And it's a yeah. change that we don't want to find. Um, so depending on how well we can work with the mega constellation launchers, it could range from a nuisance, but a manageable one to an absolute game changer. And I think there's a lot of effort right now aimed at maybe saying, instead of launching 60 satellites over and over until we've passed the point of no return, just saying, let's take a breath. Let's try and figure this out. Let's figure out what makes the most sense so that the impact, if there is one, is kept yeah. to a minimum so that we can keep doing our science. Yeah. Um, I want to encourage people to post questions if they have them. I'm going to ask one or two more questions and then we'll see uh, if you all have any, uh, anything for us uh, uh, or for Emily, I'm sorry. Um, the, the one last question I wanted to ask about that, it kind of ties back to the Mauna Kea discussion, which is, is something like, you know, part of I think what people argue about is there's a sort of balance, um, uh, which is, so I, I live in a fairly rural area and I was at a dinner meeting of you know, country folks, and I was shocked how many people were really up to date on Starlink. And you know, of course, the reason is they're you know they're underserved; they don't have fiber connections. I think most people out here use like a expensive cellular connection that's rate limited, like it's 1995 or something. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, there's like poor people in you know parts of Africa or, or say Bangladesh that don't have a lot of infrastructure. And of course, we we you know their interests are worth considering. Um, and so, I, and it's similar to to Mauna Kea, there are, there are two different interests that you know can't be 100% met. So do you, do you have a, a way of thinking about how to find balance for these things? Yeah, I mean, it. I, I really think the key is talking to people and listening to people and doing both is key. Yeah. I think scientists would happily just talk at people for a very long time. <laughs> um, but um, it's an interesting question of trying to find a way to coexist. And I'm always, so something that comes up sometimes in the Mauna Kea discussion is a fairly absolute perspective on arguments that are very nuanced and that represent a lot of people and a lot of different views. And it can sometimes be seen as, well, it's all or nothing. And you'll sometimes see Starlink posed the same way. Like we, should, we shouldn't have any satellites because they bother astronomers. And I don't think the reasonable answer in either case is an extreme. Um, I would love to see a mega constellation of satellites that can offer people the internet and the connectivity they need without damaging the night sky and without making life difficult for optical astronomers, for radio astronomers. Um, I think that you are going to, when you talk to a scientist, be very, you're, you're not going, you're going to run into problems when you tell scientists that a problem is unsolvable. Um, but <laughs> scientists also want to hear from the experts and whether that's um, activists or lawyers or um, people trying to, you know, build communication satellites. We want to find a way to actually get to a solution that lands somewhere in the middle. And it sounds yeah. like hand wavy compromise, but I actually think it's the only way forward with things like this. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's my opinion as well. Um, let's go to our, we have a few questions. If y'all have more questions, uh, please put them in. Um, this is a little bit of an inside science question, but I'm curious about the answer, uh, which is, do you have an opinion on seniority getting observation time? This is from David Gould. Uh, wow. Thoughts on seniority getting observation time versus some sort of lottery type system for assigning instrument time. So, so, so for the audience who doesn't know why that's a thing, could you explain why that's a thing and then state your opinion? Yes, and this actually is another thing that surprises people about how astronomers do our jobs. Um, I think people assume that I just have a telescope that I can go to whenever I want and that I spend a lot of time at it. And world-class research telescopes are actually a really rare commodity and we have to apply for time on them. So I'll spend maybe a handful of nights in a year using a really great telescope. And right now, the way most of these work is I submit a proposal and say, I want to study how really big stars die and make black holes and supernovae. And I'm going to do that by looking at this list of stars with, to answer this exact question. And a panel evaluates it. And if they think it's a good use of the telescope's time, they assign me a night. And I go to the telescope on that night 
and I observe. And by the way, if it's cloudy that night, you're just done because someone else is coming the next night with a new approved program. So assigning time based on scientific merit is across the board now the way that we do research. Um, years and years ago, there was a little bit of seniority. There was a bit of like, ah, oh, Professor So-and-so, who is at the um, university that has preferred time on this telescope, just has a few nights a year. And that's been moved away from, in part, because you want more equitable distribution of resources, and in part because it helps cover the really broad range of science we're trying to do. So I like the idea of evaluation based on merit. There's always the fun idea of a lottery system of just give a few nights to somebody and see what happens. <laughs> but it really has to be parsed out based on what we think the best use of the resources are. And until we get like heaps more telescopes, that's, that's the best way to approach it. So we have a question from John Carter, uh, which I think must relate to the Starlink stuff. He says, can software control the imaging camera such that it pauses capturing when a satellite is coming into the field of view? And how would that impact any special event that might be happening at that precise moment? It's a, it's a great question. And it's a really like creative solution to this problem of a satellite's only going to pass through the field of view for a second. So if you can just wait, that'll be fine. Yeah. Um, Part of this starts to become a sheer numbers game that works wonderfully when there's 9,000 satellites. It doesn't work quite as well when there's 100,000 of them. <laughs> and yeah. it also, like computationally, that's a designable thing, but that's a challenging and complicated issue. And interference is gonna be much worse in some parts of the sky than others. So it becomes a barrier that could sometimes really grind some types of science to a halt, especially if you're taking a long exposure or on the flip side, if you're trying to take very rapid exposures, the loss, even from the momentary pause could start to become an issue and keeping track of all the potential pauses that you might need to make could become very quickly unmanageable once we have a really big volume of mega constellations in the sky. There's a question I was going to ask earlier and I forgot to ask, which is, um, so you, you know, you mentioned that there are these experiments to like darken satellites or shade satellites. Mm -hmm. I assume at some point it's just physics though, like these things are getting heated. They can't not emit unless they're like magically able to absorb all wavelengths of light. So I, I assume there's just some limit, right? Yeah. I mean, once you've put something there, it's there and maybe it'll emit less light or it'll emit light in a different wavelength. But one of the amazing things about astronomy is we work across everything. So if you've made them perfectly dark and the optical astronomers are happy, the radio astronomers are probably still annoyed. And once, yeah. once an object is in space, I mean, we're, we're really good at detecting even pretty small and faint asteroids. So we'll, we'll still be able to tell these are there. I think somebody briefly recorded the like brightness variation of the Tesla that they launched. Oh <laughs> Just because they could. <laughs> yeah, so if we can see well. a car, <laughs> we're gonna see we're yeah. gonna see that we're gonna see nice flashy satellites. Um, so yeah, there are limits to how well the mitigation will work. And without testing and knowing more about them, we don't know whether mitigation is possible and what that means for the future of the project or how what the most effective combination might be. Um, I had a question from an anonymous uh, attendee, um, which is how early did satellites become an issue? I think what they mean is like, um, was this just not an issue from 1957 to uh, 2019? Or was it a smaller issue or something like that? Or do you know? It's a great question. So I think, yeah, from the launch of Sputnik onward, it must have been on astronomers' minds. I actually spoke to somebody who was observing the night that Sputnik was launched, and he remembered having sort of a philosophical discussion about what it would mean. But the idea at the time was there was one, the fir there was the yeah. first Sputnik, and there was the <laughs> wide expanse of space, and the statistics were simply on our side. Um, and now, even with as many satellites as we have up there, it's not as big of a concern. Um, if you have satellites that are higher above the earth too, or that are at different altitudes, that affects how reflective they are and the way that they communicate affects how much they interfere at radio wavelengths. So it's really varied from satellite to satellite. Like you could, for example, see the um, International Space Station passing overhead. And I don't, I cannot think of a research result I've seen. I'm sure there's something somewhere, but those are very rarely a problem for astronomers. And relatively just once we have this many and once they seem to be getting launched in a configuration and setup that makes them very bright and very noticeable and all over the place, it starts to become a concern. So it's, you know, the first rabbit in your garden 
in the problem. And then once, right, once a right. hundred of them are there, it's a different topic. Um, I have a question from David Gould that honestly, I'm not sure it's, it looks pretty in the weeds to me, but I have a feeling some people want to hear the answer, which is, are there conflicts between astronomers and SETI researchers wanting optical slash radio telescope time, or can their observations coexist? Can they get along? So all, all of us get along. Um, <laughs> and of course, that's, that's, you can imagine the wonderful scientific debates that we have within the astronomy community, but SETI is a branch of astronomy and SETI can apply for the same telescope time as the rest of us. And beyond, like sometimes telescopes will say, we've set aside a little time to specifically look at exoplanets, for example, or we have a certain amount of time that we're dedicating to a long-term project that got time years ago that's repeating. But apart from that, we all apply based on the merits of our science and evaluate based on the merits of our science. For something big, like the Hubble Space Telescopes, you have other experts evaluating you. So I'll submit a proposal about stars and star experts will read it. And someone else will submit a proposal about galaxies and galaxy experts will read it. So we try to keep a balance at telescopes of really serving all of the different scientific needs of the community. So there isn't, I know this is depicted in contact that there's people that are sort of mad that Jodie Foster's character is wasting time looking for aliens when they could be looking for other legitimately very cool science. But in real life, she would have, she would have gotten that telescope time the same way as everybody else did. And she can use it for what she proposed. <laughs> I have a question from Heather Crullin. Uh, this is a broad one, but maybe that's as, as we get toward the end of this, a good place to go. She, she asks, what are future questions for astronomy? Uh, what, what are people thinking about? That's a great question. Um, oh, there's, I think a lot of the future questions now are things that we're imagining with an eye toward what our jobs are gonna be like and what our tools are going to be. So um, we were talking about Vera Rubin earlier and there's a new telescope being built in Chile um, that's named for her now. It's the Vera C. Rubin Observatory. And it's designed to survey this huge swath of the Southern sky every three nights for 10 years. So it's going to effectively build a movie, a decade long movie of the night sky. So we will ask questions with a telescope like that in mind, going, what's it gonna be like when we find a thousand supernovae in a night? Or what's it going to be like when we find something we've never seen before with the telescope like that? Like what, what are we going to discover that we can't even imagine? And how do you design a telescope to discover the thing you never imagined? So the unknown is really a puzzle when we start trying to design telescopes. Um, more immediately, there's a lot of research being done right now on other planets, on other planets that could support life, on how we could spot life on other planets and what that means. Um, and there's a lot of research that I'm excited about right now on something called gravitational waves. So these are these little like ripples in the fabric of space time caused by enormous black holes colliding that wind up sending these echoes through space time that we can detect amazingly enough here on Earth. Um, we just detected gravitational waves for the first time five years ago in um, September of 2015. And we're now finding more of them. We're thinking about building more observatories that are capable of doing this. But it winds up posing such fundamental questions about like gravity and how space yeah. and time work. So that's for sure going to be an exciting new area. Yeah, it's fun. I, it the, the, the gravity wave stuff reminds me of, I have a friend who works in, in quantum computing and he gets asked like, when are we gonna have a computer? And he's like, I don't even care. That's not why this is interesting. It's interesting because there are fundamental questions that get to be answered when we know more about this. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I, uh, this I'm hoping this, we can keep this going a little yeah, longer. Because, yeah, absolutely. I was gonna say, because, since we got a little bit of a late start, but yeah. Yeah, yeah. no, we, got, we, we still have a few more questions to get through at least. Um, um, Heather Cullen asks, Star Trek or Star Wars? Star Wars. Wow. Original. That's, that's a, original. Original. But isn't that, so maybe I'm being stereotypical. My impression is it's the, the literature students like Star Wars and it's the science people are supposed to like Star Trek. I think you're on the wrong side of the fence. I wrote a book. <laughs> <laughs> but truly, I enjoy, I enjoy both. But I, my, like, the, kid, the thing that like, made an impression on my kid brain was Star Wars. I, yeah, I'm, I'm there with you. I, yeah. I, yeah, Star Trek is a mystery show in space. Um, <laughs> uh, Star Trek has some really cool astronomy in it, to be fair. <laughs> yes. But yeah, Star Wars. <laughs> um, Wendy 
uh, Karande uh, it says, what is the most challenging night you've had as an observer and why? So first of all, hi, Wendy. Wendy and I know each other from a summer research experience that I actually write about in the book. Um, the most challenging night I've had as an observer, I think I also write about in the book, it is the sort of framing of the third chapter because it was research that I was trying to do for my PhD thesis. And I had applied and gone through that whole evaluation process and gotten time to study stars with this amazing telescope in Chile. And I flew from like Massachusetts at the time to Chile and got all set up. And I spent four nights there, two nights at the telescope and we never opened the dome. We never, like the, the telescope never even got exposed to the sky because it was so windy we couldn't safely open the dome. Um, there's these safety limits at telescopes saying, you know, if the wind is blowing too hard or if there's any moisture, or there's any ice or anything like that, we leave the telescope closed because the mirror of the telescope is so precious that like sandblasting it or stuff falling onto it or like ice forming on it would just be terrible. So I sat there for two nights doing nothing. And I just remember being there going like, why am I in this job? I'm trying to graduate and finish my PhD my boyfriend at the time now husband are living across the country from one another and I just need to finish and it was this very frustrating moment where I was just like there's nothing I can do I'm as prepared as I could be and the wind has upended a year of work and um, it becomes a funny philosophy in astronomy um, I think you will be very hard-pressed to find an astronomer who has any kind of good opinion about astrology um, we don't have, there is no scientific basis for the position of the constellations, the motion of the planets, doing anything to our day-to-day -day lives, unless you're an astronomer, because <laughs> the way the night sky behaves on a particular night while you're studying it can delay your thesis by a year or give you an amazing new scientific result. And it's a really surprising contradiction to sometimes run into. So that was a frustrating night of not being able to fix what I desperately wanted to fix, which was the weather. Um, and then fortunately, I eventually got to go back and get the data and it went wonderfully, but that was a, me that was a memory that made it into the book. Yeah. Um, I have a really interesting question from David Gould, which is, is anyone working on loitering atmospheric space telescopes, i.e. a combo of SOFIA and say NASA Helios long duration solar aircraft? Mm. Um, so this gets into a really fun realm of airborne astronomy. Um, when I wrote The Last Stargazers, I wanted to focus, I decided I was going to focus it on ground-based telescopes. And then I immediately got creative with the definition of ground-based because I wrote about <laughs> Sophia. I reasoned, I think the telescope started and ended on the ground, so it'll be fine. Um, and I started writing about things like balloon-based observing. So astronomers will design telescopes or observing instruments that will get sent up on um, experimental balloons and sort of hover and take data from as high in the atmosphere as they can possibly get. And if you hear balloon and think of like a little kid's party balloon or like a hot air balloon, these balloons are the size of football fields and they can carry really heavy payloads and stay aloft for hours and hours on, um, I think sometimes multiple days at a time. So those are a little closer to the sort of loitering idea. Um, and then beyond that, we'll have things like the Hubble Space Telescope that's up there permanently or space probes like the Parker Solar Probe that we're sending towards the sun or um, the probe that we sent out past Pluto, New Horizons. But it really depends on the kind of scientific question we want to answer and where the best place for the telescope is. So it'll be anywhere from, you know, shot out through the solar system to hanging from a balloon to stuck in the back of a plane. Um, we have a question from an anonymous attendee, uh, which is about dark matter, uh, dark stuff in general. How close do you think we are to explain the missing 80% matter of the universe? Oh, hmm. I don't know. That's a great question. So one of the big puzzles, um, when we talk about the universe as a whole is we look at, we basically try to add up all the matter and energy in the universe. And with what we can easily see, we fall far short. Um, we know that some tiny fraction of the universe is regular matter. So, you know, what we're all made of, um, some fraction past that is dark matter. And then some very large fraction is what we would refer to as dark energy and disentangling what dark energy really is and what it means or what particle or what unit we would 
invoke to explain what dark matter is are really active ongoing questions. Uh, the person that asked about future questions in astronomy, this is most certainly one of them. And some people tackle this from a very physics-y standpoint. They'll do particle physics experiments to try and get at the really fundamental building blocks of what these missing pieces of the universe could be. Some people observe entire clusters of galaxies to try and explain it that way. So it's hard to say how close we are. We could have some really astonishing breakthrough very soon, or it could be a much kind of longer and more diligent process to try and figure it out. We, we, with, with dark matter, the impression I have as, as an outside observer is that the public thinks it's, maybe this is true, who knows, but among scientists, it's, it, it, there's a pretty good consensus. Is that, is that right? Um, I think there is a, there's something of a consensus on what it is not. Um, there's very eager, ex there's, and I understand this, but there's always an eagerness to say, well, maybe dark matter isn't a thing. Maybe we take a different view of gravity or we take some different perspective on objects that we think we know and understand like black holes. And those explanations have been pretty well chipped away at, um, I always love when people are still sort of poking at it because the best science happens when we try to poke holes in our ideas, but we're settling on the idea that there needs to be a sort of particle physics style explanation or something fairly fundamental about a building block of how the universe works that can be used to explain dark matter. So, so uh, the, the problem as I understand it is we haven't figured out how to like detect it, uh, do you, uh, other than seeing the effects of it. Um, so, so, um, can you talk about some of the experiments that are going on to try to do that? Um, I'm actually, that actually starts drifting very far oh, from the sort of astronomy area. that I talked about in the book, only because it becomes the realm of the particle physicists and sort of very theoretical right. astrophysicists, because we can't do it with the telescope. With the telescope, we have the amazing evidence that Vera Rubin came up with for where dark matter is and how it behaves and what it does. But because we can't just look at it, in that way. It means that we need to turn to a very different set of experiments to really learn more. Yeah. I have uh, one question, then I want to do a closing question. Um, so Aaron McClary asks, what is your all-time favorite constellation? That's a great question. Um, my all-time favorite constellation is definitely Orion. Um, it's a fall winter constellation, so it should be coming back soonish to give it a little more time. Um, it has my favorite star in it, which is Betelgeuse. Um, so Betelgeuse is the bright red star in one of Orion's shoulders, and it is a star known as a red supergiant, which is my particular research specialty. So these are huge stars. They're at least 10 times as massive as our sun, but if you were to put a red supergiant where the, our sun is, it would reach out like to the orbit of Jupiter. They're just enormous. And these are the types of stars that when they die, they make an enormous supernova and they create a black hole. And we still have so many questions about just the nuts and bolts of how these stars work. Those are the stars that I did my very first research project on. And they're the stars that I gravitated to literally because I thought that they would help me study black holes. And then I got interested in the stars themselves. I loved that there were all these physics puzzles inside what you might just picture as, you know, kind of a big cold ball of gas. And there's so much about them we don't know. So every time I look at Orion, I look at Betelgeuse. It's a nice way to kind of see with my eyes the kinds of stars that I study all the time. And Orion also has this wonderful nebula in Orion's, um, in the sword that um, you, it's just nicknamed the Orion Nebula. And it's basically the birthplace of new stars. It's one of my favorite things to look at with the backyard telescope. So definitely my favorite constellation. Do, do you still do that? Do you still go out uh, at night and, and just look? I do. It's funny because I don't often, you know, like set up for a night of stargazing and head out with my binoculars. Um, I'll do that. I did that for Comet Neowise just because that was such a, one in a once in a lifetime cool event. But it'll more be that I'm walking around and I'll be walking with a group of friends or something and I'll glance up and it'll be a clear night and then I'm just done. Like everyone else keeps walking <laughs> and it, it really does even like city sky where you can only see a few stars it's still just really cool. Um, I think astronomers yeah. get into what we do out of some very like basic love of that sort of thing. Um, I remember looking through a pretty big telescope with other astronomers and actually peering through an eyepiece and people's attitude of just being like, oh, 
oh my god look at the nebula they're so shiny like we sounded like a bunch of six-year-olds yeah. but the excitement's still there so yeah it's even when i'm just glancing at the sky it'll be that same attitude yeah i, I feel like the, the most underappreciated thing about being a nerd is when you have a lot of knowledge in there uh you see a little thing and it means a lot of things to you oh yeah um so that that brings me to the last question I wanted to ask. Uh, let me just make sure I got to pretty much everything. Um, so I have a six-year-old who, at least this week, maybe wants to be an astronomer, she thinks. Um, <laughs> so for people who might have young people who haven't made up their minds and you want to steer into astronomy, what should they be doing? <laughs> I, love, I love this question because I was the really little kid that was really into astronomy. And um, this is a story I relate in the book, but I didn't know any professional scientists. I didn't know any professional astronomers growing up. And my mom was giving me books on astronomy, but I didn't know where else to go. And I met one professional astronomer and told him, I'm going to be an astronomer. What should I do? And he looked at me and he said, take all the math you can. <laughs> and I think my response at the time was just like, okay. <laughs> and just like <laughs> tried to go off and follow those instructions. Yeah. Um, so I had a very similar advice that um, the math really is the language of the science that we do. And I think today, computer science goes alongside it. Um, some people hear this and they think like, oh, great, I'm really good at math. Or I love computers, this is perfect. And then some people hear this answer and kind of go, oh god, really? Like, I never liked math. I was, I was terrible at math in school. I'm just not a math person. And I always try to push back against that idea because um, whoever's saying that, they for sure do something that they love that somebody else finds tough. It might be ballet or soccer or skiing or some skill that they weren't good at at first and then practiced and started to get better at. And we tend to hold up math and programming as two really scary things that you either can or can't do. But just like anything else, it's something you learn and practice and get better at. And um, it's something that I tackled very much in part because I knew I needed it. It was a tool that I needed to become a scientist. I wasn't super into computer programming when I first started it. And then I quickly started loving it because I saw what it could do even before I was really any good at it. So that, that was the nice motivation to have in the background and then looking at it, not as this like scary monolith, but just as like a thing that I could try to practice and get better at until maybe I was good at it was a really nice way to keep going. Yeah, I, my, my theory is that basically everyone is bad at math. Uh, and, <laughs> and so, so you have to, I, I was just talking to a mathematician friend uh, about uh, Fermat's last theorem, and he was like, not only do I not understand the proof, if the guy explained it to me, I still wouldn't understand it. <laughs> like, I think there's no such thing as a nat natural mathematician. There's probably better and worse, but all of us have to struggle. Well, and there's always that satisfaction of taking something you can't do and then one day being able to do it. And right. whether it's math or sports or any skill at all, like math is no different than anything else and that it's just something you can practice and learn and eventually kind of yeah. get your arms around, which I love about it. Yeah, I don't, we, we, we single out math as like the thing you either can do or cannot. Uh, I and I, I don't know, I'm sure there's some interesting history there. Yeah. But um, uh, well, I, I guess we're getting sort of short on time. Um, yeah. did, did I miss anything, have, anything cool? Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Rick. I was just say, Emily, if you had anything else you want to say um, as, as, we, as we wind down or conclude, yes. Sure. I mean, I'm really glad to see that people came and had these questions. And a lot of the questions that were asked today were actually at the heart of why I wound up writing the book, because everybody will come to me and say, oh, I've got a space question. Tell me something about SpaceX. Tell me something about how you use telescope time, um, how, you, how my kid can become an astronomer. And this is what I mean when I say that everybody's curious about something to do with space. And what I tried to do with the last stargazers is answer those questions and also give people a glimpse into what our actual lives and stories are like. Because a surprising amount of the book covers the science of what we do and then things like, what do you actually do when you get on a telescope plane? Or what's it like when you're working at a telescope trying to answer questions about stars and suddenly a volcano erupts 90 miles away, which happened to someone here in Washington when Mount St. Helens erupted. So those are the kind of human sides of the science. And the idea of the book was to give people a kind of behind the scenes tour of astronomy and of how we do the work that we do. I always love behind the scenes reels for things like movies because it lets me really 
learn kind of the, it lifts the curtain behind the magic and lets me see how it happens and lets it feel a little more real to me. So that's very much what The Last Stargazers is meant to do. Jack, anything else? Yes. No, it's, it's actually, been a wonderful. Yes. Actually, we do the, we're doing this, but if, uh, oh, okay. I didn't think this yes. got done. But if you peel off the hardcover, yes. you do get some. You get some uh, stars. Uh, and what constellation is this? It's just a star field image that they were able to oh. get. But what I love about <laughs> it is we talked about the photographic plates that we used to use to observe, and they didn't look that different than this. So it's a line drawing of a galaxy. It shows this dark galaxy on a pale background. And that's how those plates would work. They were covered with a chemical that would darken when it was exposed to light. So you got these beautiful little like dark gray galaxies on a clear plate. And when we moved to digital imaging, we went from this to the multiple filters we could apply and the beautiful color images we could build. Uh, that design was a happy accident, but I was delighted when I saw the work that the artists at Sourcebooks did on the cover because it was such a perfect encapsulation of the story I told in the book. Well, I will say, um, as people get the book and see it, there's, um, it's certainly a beautifully written book, but it's got some nice use of, of uh, photographs within it, including a photograph of six-year-old Emily in a Hubble t-shirt, uh, <laughs> sort of <laughs> clearly captivated by all of this. Um, so what would normally be happening at the bookstore at this point, um, there'd be applause and you would step to the back of the room and get to sign books. We aren't able to quite do that yet uh, right now, but um, we will have signed copies when we get it worked out for Emily to come by the store. And you can get those by either um, going to our website and uh, the link we have there, or uh, you can even call the store now. We actually opened a little bit for the walk curbside walk up. And on our website, you also see news of other evenings such as this, in fact, tomorrow night, um, this is not a this is not a um, theme, but we have another Seattle writer debut, uh, Molly Weisenberg, who is also a restaurant person, and um, and her memoir is called The Fixed Stars. So uh, uh, it sounds a little uh, celestial, but uh, her her book is doesn't spend as much time up in the in, in the sky as it is down here, but it's a wonderful book. And on Friday we are presenting a program with Isabel Wilkerson. Uh, who a few years, 10 years ago, did The Warmth of Other Suns. Her new book is uh, just getting out. It's called Cast the Origins of Our Discontents. Uh, so those are information on these and everything else are um, on our website. And um, we thank you both so much, Zach, um, for staying up late uh, with uh, back there in Virginia. Um, and Emily, thank you so much. And we're so excited and congratulations. We've Actually, I do have a glass, but it's not in, in, not, not in range here to raise and, so, <laughs> and toast you to... Uh, this um, wonderful debut and wonderful publication. So, and thank you everyone else. Thank you for your questions. Thank you for your presence. And um, we hope to see you again soon. Thank you. Yeah, thank you everyone. Thank you. Okay. Have a good night, y'all. Yeah. Bye. The, oh, there we go. Yes. Go. Yes. <laughs> thank you. <laughs>